In this video, we're gonna build out our tasks page where all of our to-do items will be. And this will include building out a component right here. Okay, so let's go through our normal layout system. And the first step is to identify the atomic widgets, the widgets that don't have any children. So let's start at the top here and we've got a text widget right up there. Then we've got another text widget in here and this thing right here, which could be multiple different things, but we're gonna use a checkbox. So let's drag this out right here. Then down here, we've got this thing and Flutterflow has a specialty widget for this. It's the floating action button. And this is a page level element that sits outside of the main widget hierarchy. And finally, we've got this nav bar right here, which we'll build in a later video. So we'll just leave it at blank. Now I did skip over this item right here, and that's because this list will be dynamically generated. So there'll be one component for each task document in our database. So we can just design one. Okay, so first step done. Second step, group close widgets in columns, rows, or stacks. So our closest items right here are our checkbox and text. They're next to each other. So obviously that's going to be a row. So let's pull that out. Let's just stack them on top of one another. So we got some room going on right here. Beautiful. And then our third step, does this need a background? And it does. We got this white thing with a border. So let's pull out a container. Let's grab all these. Let's bring them down and let's pull these out to their proper place in the hierarchy. Okay, now we repeat the second and third step, grouping and background, until we've got one widget. Now, we do have one kind of hidden one here, and that's because we're gonna need to have a bunch of these items, so we need our container to be inside some widget that can take a bunch of children. And you might think, well, they're stacked on top of one another, so it's probably a column. But for any list where you're generating a bunch of children, there's actually a special widget for that, and that's the list view. And the reason that it's special is that a list view is made for high performance for a lot of children because it loads and paints only the widgets that you see on screen. It will lazy load everything else. The column is designed for your main app's architecture, not for showing tons of widgets. So let's grab our list view right here and pull one out so we can dump it in here. And then let's just move these down. Then we ask, does this list view need a background? No, we can see through to the background right there. So then we just have two items left because remember our floating action button sits outside the main body of widgets. So we just have these two items and those are stacked on top of one another. So that will be a column. Beautiful. And that's it. Our widget tree is done. Let's go build it. So this is what we were working with before, so let's just delete everything. We can turn off our safe area now, and we're going to need a column, some text, a list view, and then inside our list view, we're gonna have a container, a row, a checkbox, and some text. Finally, we need to add in our floating action button. All right, beautiful, widget tree is built. Let's move on to our styling and spacing. So our first step is to set the determinant heights and widths and things that are specific. So let's come into our text right here. I remember from the design that it is a headline medium. Let's change the text. This should be tasks. Then we can come down to our container. We know that it has that style. Our checkbox down here is not going to be square, but it's gonna be a circular check. And our text is going to be body medium. Next, let's come down to our floating action button right here. So the elevation is going to be zero color is going to be white. Let's grab our icon right here and we want this to be our black and we're actually going to wrap this in a container and give it a infinite height and width so it fills it up. And This is how we're going to get our border out of it and let's give it a border of one pixel and border radius of 50. Beautiful. Lastly, we want our fill color to be our green. And let's bump up our icon size to about 30. Okay, next up is to set alignments on columns, rows, and stacks. We've got one column over here, and we want the main axis alignment to start at the top, that's correct, but we want the cross axis to be over here, so that'll bump our tasks over there. That looks good. Everything else looks good for alignment, so we're on to spacing, and we'll just give it some 12 pixels of spacing. Lastly, let's add our padding. 
padding, and we need padding on these four sides. But before we do that, let me fix our scrolling. So whenever you have one scrolling widget inside another scrolling widget, so here we have a list view inside a column, you need to make sure that your scrolling works as you planned it. Now, whenever you have a scrolling widget inside a column here, that scrolling widget needs to have one of two things applied to it. Either a height constraint, so your list view is wrapped in a container and given a specific height, or flexible or expanded. And that's because columns don't have a height. They look to their children for a height. And if the child says, give me all the height, which is what a scrolling widget says, then it doesn't know how to lay out. No, you might be wondering, wait, why is it not breaking now? Well, it's not breaking now because Flutterflow has automatically added this shrink wrap to it. But that's not ideal for performance because in order to shrink wrap it, it will have to do all the computation about its children. But the nature of the list view is that it lazy loads widgets. It doesn't have to compute all of that. But if we turn this off, it's going to break. And we fix that by one of those two options. And the easiest way to do this is to come into your list view and add an expanded property. This is a property inside of columns that tells the child how to handle all the rest of the space in the column. And this is saying, take up the rest of the space that you have. That's as big as you can be. So now we can go down to our shrink wrap right here, turn it off, and it doesn't break. This also means that our scrolling will work properly. Okay, back to padding. Now, the easiest way to handle this is just come up to our top widget here and add some padding on all four sides. And it looks fine right now, but we will run into a problem. And let me show you what that is. So if I grab this container right here and make it bigger so that it overflows, you can see that our scroll bar is right over here and it's over our content. And we don't want that. So we don't want to put our padding up there. The answer is to just move down in your hierarchy of your widgets and apply padding in there. Now, it's not as an elegant solution because there won't be one single source of your padding, but it will solve the problem. Now, we can still add the padding on the top and the bottom of our column. So let's go here and add 24 pixels on the top and the bottom. That's because there's no scroll bars there. Then we can come to our text here, add 24 pixels there, and then come into our container right here and give this 24 pixels there and 24 pixels there. So now if we take our container and and pull it out. When we scroll, you can see that the bar is on the side as we normally expect. Beautiful. Okay, this layout is almost done. The one thing we want to check for is overflow errors whenever you have text fields like this, especially when they're dynamic. So right now we don't see any errors, but what happens if this overflows the bounds right here? Well, what do we want to happen? Well, we want it to just gracefully wrap onto the next line. And the way you do that inside of a row is you can just apply flexible. And flexible is the other expansion property that's designed to handle the extra space in a column or a row. Flexible just says you are able to take up the rest of the space it's not forcing you. And when you hit the rest of the space, you'll just wrap down onto the bottom. Finally, let's add some padding in our row right here. And we'll just give it 12 pixels on each side. Beautiful. Okay, our widget tree and our styling is done. But now we need to create our component. And there are a couple of ways to do this. We want to come over to the top element right here. And we can either right click and convert to component or we can come over to our properties panel right here and add it here. This is going to be an individual task. So we can just do that and create component. Now we're brought into the component design view. And you can see we're on that component here. The component is marked by a diamond as opposed to a page. And you can go back to the page you are on just by clicking here. And we're back to our page. Now our list view is populated with this component right here. And to edit it, you can come in here and click this pencil or the way I like to do it, just double click into it. Beautiful. Okay, so now that we're here, designing components always has two steps. The first step is design. The second step is parameters. So here, most of our component is already designed. Let's just come into our container for now and give it a width of infinity. And let's remove the height right here because we want the height to be determined by the text inside. All right, design done. Next, 
parameters. And the parameters will be the data that will be sent into your component when it goes onto a page. Not here, this is in the design view, over here. Because when this is on a page, there will be different text that comes into here. It's not all gonna say hello world, of course. And the way you determine what parameters you need is to ask yourself, what about this component will change? That is, every time I use this on a page, what are the different aspects of it that will change? Well, the text will change. And if we look over at our design, this component gets used both on the tasks page and the completed page, and we can see that that checkbox changes too. So we'll need some parameter for the checkbox. And creating parameters has three steps. Define, bind, and pass. So first, define it. Okay, so let's set those up. Let's double click on our component, and here's our component parameters. If you're not seeing them, you probably have a widget selected here, and you can just select the root widget or just click off onto the canvas canvas and you'll see this. Next, click plus and the first one to add will be the text right here. So this will be the task text and it will be of type string. Confirm and then we'll need one more for this checkbox right here. So let's add another one in. Let's add a parameter. So this will be whether it is completed and the type is going to be a boolean and confirm first step done we've defined our parameters next let's bind them because these parameters aren't connected to anything in this component they're just sitting there so we need to bind them so let's come over to our text right here and let's come into our binding and bind it to our text let's add a default value task and confirm. Next, we want to come over to our checkbox right here and bind that, the initial checkbox value. We want that bound to our completed parameter. Beautiful. Second step done. Third step is to pass. That is, pass the data into these parameters. And that happens on the pages where you have the component. So here's our component. And when you scroll down, you can see we have those parameters that we set up. There's nothing in them right now because we need to pass in the data. Okay, so what do we pass in? Well, remember, this list will be dynamically generated. It'll be generated based on our Firestore collection of tasks. And we haven't bound that collection here yet. So first we have to do that. So we come into our list view right here, into this third option, a backend query, and add a query. And then we want to query a collection. It will be our tasks, list of documents, but we don't want to list all the documents, we want to filter them because we only want to show the documents for that user. We don't want people to see everyone's tasks. So let's come into a filter right here. We want to filter by the user and we want the user to be equal to the authenticated user. Confirm. But that's not the only filter we want because this is the tasks page for tasks that are not completed yet. So we also want to filter out tasks that have been completed. So we could just add another filter. And inside here, we want to filter on the completed property and we want it where the completed property is equal to false. That is, it isn't completed. And confirm. Beautiful. Now that we see multiple children here, we need to give them a little breathing room. So let's scroll down to our item spacing and give them 12 pixels. Okay, so now we've bound this list. It's dynamically generating one component for each task. So now we have data. We have those documents to pass in the data. So let's come in here and let's pass in the task text, come into this binding, come into this tasks document, and it'll be the title. Next, let's come into our completed property. Same thing, our task document and that completed property. Beautiful. So now we have this dynamically generated data and we can bind the individual parameters right here. So let's come into our task text and it's coming from that task document. This is new now, now that we've made this binding. So we can twirl it open and we want the title. Now, whenever you do a binding, make sure you go in and set a default variable value to avoid null errors. We can just say title and let's do the same thing with our completed property. And it's the same thing. Let's open up our task document and select completed. Now, you may be wondering, Wait, I thought we filtered out the completed. Why do we need to apply it here? Well, remember, the parameters are there so that our component works everywhere where it needs to work. So we use this component on this page where it will be unchecked and on the completed page 
where it'll be checked. This way, it will happen automatically, and we don't have to take the extra step of clicking it on or clicking it off. We could do it that way. Now, you also might be thinking, hey, wouldn't there be a more efficient way to do this passing of parameters? Because can't I pass the whole document? And yes, that's exactly right. So let's refactor this and see how that works. So we're going to double click into our component. And instead of defining these two parameters, let's get rid of them and instead pass one parameter, which will be our tasks document. This will be of type document, and we can set the collection type of tasks. Let's confirm that. Now we have to go back to our binding step, to our text, into our tasks document, and then we can get a document property and select that property. Let's set the default value and confirm. Same thing over here to our checkbox, checkbox, task document, get the property, completed, and confirm. We've defined it, we've bound it, now we gotta pass it. So let's come back over here into our component, and now we just need to pass our document. Confirm. Okay, so why did I bring you through that? And why is this more efficient? Well, I wanted to bring you through that so you can see the flexibility of Flutterflow and to understand the structure of how data works. Now, why is this better? Well, it's better because it's more flexible. So if we ever need to add another property to our component, we don't have to define another parameter and then pass it in because we're already getting the whole document. And with that, this page is done. We were able to design this page, style it, and build a component. In the next video, we'll design the bottom sheet and the logic for adding tasks. We'll see you there.